Hi, everybody. I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit, The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something not through no fault of our own or through our own making we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources so that no matter where you are on your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. It's a beautiful day in paradise, and I'm talking to my Canadian friends today, and I sure hope that they're listening to the replays because it's usually cold, cold, cold up there, and it is hot, hot, hot down here in Florida. And uh, I say that because yesterday I spent half the day planting some crepe myrtle, which are absolutely gorgeous. But as I was digging the hole, it was 106 degrees, felt like 106 degrees outside. And I'm thinking, why am I doing this? Except now I'm looking out my window and I'm seeing that beautiful pink flower and thinking, that's exactly why I did it. So it is another beautiful day in paradise and it makes me happy to see my flowers happy. So today we want rain, rain, rain to help them come out. So folks, this is a great day for Stand Up and Speak Up. I have a new guest today, a new friend of mine who I've not met in person, but I was introduced to her through a great friend of mine, Keith Jowers from Jacksonville. Those of you that uh, have watched my show might remember Keith. He's my actor friend, police friend, former police officer who has written books and has done some modeling, and he's just darling, he and his wife, Glenda, and I thank him for introducing me to my special guest today, Beth Bethany Bryan. Bethany, welcome from Jacksonville. Yes, it's good to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. You have a really special story, and I'm, I'm looking, always looking for people that are willing to stand up and speak up about things that have happened in their lives and that are turning their pain into their passion, into their purpose. And when I heard your story, I'm thinking, that's a girl for me. So welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. so much. (laughs) All right, Bethany, I mentioned to you earlier that when I start the show, I really like to have my guests tell a little bit about who they are so that our listeners can understand who you are from when you were young. Mm -hmm. So where did you grow up? A little bit about your family, and then we'll go in. From there. Perfect. Um, yeah, well, I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and we moved around a little bit when I got a little older. I lived in Kentucky for a short time. I also lived in Washington State because my father's from there, uh, which was a big difference than, you know, warm Florida. <laughs> so I am not a big fan of the cold. <laughs> Learn that. Um, but I do. I, Washington is beautiful as far as like you know, they're like, we used to go to like Oregon and then the beaches there just like unreal. So that part of it, I love, and I'll go visit there. No problem. <laughs> um, but living there now. Uh, and so I was, uh, born to two very, very faith filled parents. Um, and when I was born, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, um, which at that time in the nineties, it was devastating news. You know, now we have more medical advancements than we did back then. So it was considered like terminal. Um, They told my parents that I probably wouldn't live to be six. And my parents being who they were, they were like, well, we're not going to accept that. So, (laughs) um, so right off the bat, they were speaking life. And, um, you know, my mom had to really balance, um, you know, faith and giving the medications and whatnot. She basically was my nurse. Um, But I remember you know, just growing up and hearing like them always like reiterate the fact that, you know, you are not this illness. This illness is not you. This is just some, it's part of your testimony. That's how they taught me. And so CF really was just that. So growing up, it was just an appointment every three months, you know, and 
Uh, we didn't let it limit me. They put me in ballet. They put me in school, these kind of things. Um, as I got older, and I have a younger sister, and I have an older stepmother too. And, uh, and so, you know, my sister is eight years apart, like we're eight years apart. So she was my, my gift. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure mom and dad were like done after me because they had their hands full, <laughs> but then I started praying and praying. And so I was like, I need a friend. <laughs> and so she came along and it was just that, like, she's my best friend, um, really kind of just balancing, uh, being so much older. And then the stuff we went through as family, um, you know, it became more of like a parent sometimes versus sibling sometimes like that, that relationship was kind of, you know, we had to juggle that and figure out, okay, now I'm, I'm here to protect you. Now I'm here to, you know, just have fun and play Barbies. <laughs> you know? So it was like, it was very different. Um, and then same thing with my parents. So both of my parents actually battled mental illness. Um, my dad was diagnosed with acute schizophrenia, uh, back when he was younger, so, you know, we, we would have these like little kind of like episodes um, is what we called them. Uh, and they were, there was like a, you know, it, it was like stress induced episodes is how they, you know, medically uh, labeled him. And uh, so I remember growing up and also dealing with the fact of like, you know, you kind of learn a pattern of like, okay, dad's, you know, checked out right now. Like uh, we need to kind of like, you know, there was times where I had to become parent too. And so I remember going through that as well and being more of just like a shoulder for my mom, you know, to kind of lean on, uh, even like, gosh, I remember his first episode, I was like eight years old or something like that, like really young. So it's something that we tried to protect my sister from when she was growing up. I remember my mom kind of like having like this little code <laughs> of like looking at each other, like, okay, this is happening. You know, let's do whatever we need to do to protect her kind of thing. And then of course, you know, they, they would periodically happen. And so there was no keeping her from it, you know, at, at a certain point. And so she had to really learn that, okay, there's, you know, there's this issue that we, you know, she felt like everybody else was kind of in on and she was left out <laughs> and, um, and really she was, but it was, you know, to kind of protect her, but you know, you don't really understand that sometimes when you're a teenager, just trying to figure things out. And so that's kind of, that was, that was really my background and my, my growing up was very shaky as far as, you know, like one moment it could be okay. The next moment we don't know. And so I remember always kind of being on edge and always like, you know, not only thank God CF was not, you know, a huge part of my life at that point. Um, it really didn't show up, you know, big until like 16, um, which was very rare for CF. Uh, especially being diagnosed at birth. So thankfully <laughs> that was a blessing from God because, you know, we had all these other things going on. So really dealing with that, that shakiness, um, I felt honestly though, like it prepared me for everything I was going to go through in my adult life. And that's just the way God works. <laughs> and so like, you can look back and go, man, I have all these little things that I wish I could change or wish I didn't have to go through as a kid. But honestly, I, I, don't, I wouldn't change anything because everything that happened, like helped prepare me for what I was to go through when I was an adult. Well, it's very interesting. Um, I did a little bit of research on CF this morning as I was looking at videos about you and, and I saw that it was mostly, mostly young men mm. uh, and as children and years ago, like you said, they say, mm -hmm. well, the kids would live to age 10. Mm -hmm. So, but as, as you just said, though, it didn't affect you physically, apparently. Mm -hmm. As a child, because I was wondering, did your parents keep you from gym class or mm. teachers to be careful with you or any, but that wasn't the case, was yeah. it? Yeah, no, there was like, a, there was a few tiny things growing up that, you know, kind of caught my parents off guard, but they learned about, they had like a book that my mom was given, uh, of like all things CF, <laughs> like a CF Bible, I guess you'd say. And so she would try to like find, okay, she's having this issue, like what's going on, but it was mostly digestion. Yeah. So CF affects, you know, multiple organs, um, but mostly it would be digestion because your pancreas is not functioning properly and your lungs. Well, my lungs were like great. Um, and so they were able to put me in ballet. They were able to put me in school. Uh, when I got a little bit older, you know, my mom started a little bit panicking about like all the germs and whatnot. So she did pull me and homeschool me after eighth grade. Um, but like she, she loved putting me in drama. She loved putting me in classes. Like 
And I'm thankful for that. Thankful I wasn't like a bubble child. <laughs> and was that more of a release? I've watched some of your, your acting thing. Oh yeah. It looks like it's a, it can put you in another world. It does. So acting is one of my favorite things because I've, um, and again, going back to childhood, I remember, you know, playing pretend with my sister all the time. And so Barbies were our favorite. Like we just would come up with these crazy stories. And, and I remember sitting there going, okay, this is going to happen. Like we're going to do this. And, you know, this is the bad guy. This is the good guy, you know, kind of thing. And so she, she acts too. So, <laughs> so we both uh, just like kind of becoming that other character is really fun. And then you just kind of, you, there's like a, there's a sense that I like whenever I play a character of like, I write my own backstory for a character, usually if it's not given to me, because the backstory is super important to me, you know, like, well, why does my character feel this kind of thing? And so I go in depth with the acting, but it was whenever um, I was doing competition through my church, um, that was a big, you know, step of faith for my mom, especially because I did what was called human video. And human video is a very different way of acting, but it's to like music. So it's kind of like mime. Um, so you have like the, the acting and all you have is your body language and your facial expressions. Well, my first year, um, I got the lead role <laughs> in it. So they just kind of like threw me in there and, uh, I did fine arts for a couple of years and I still to this day coach fine arts. So I coach students in acting. Um, and so it's always been like a huge part of me, but you know, the Lord really blessed me. He showed me that this was something that I was gifted for. And he told my mom that because it's very physical. Like you have to do like, I remember doing like some push-ups and stuff like that. And at one point I had a pick line in my arm because wow. <laughs> at this point I had, uh, you know, CF had already started showing up. I think I was 18 when I started fine arts. And, um, and so I was going into the hospital, you know, a couple of times. It wasn't as much as, as normal CF patients, but, um, and I was like, I have to, I finished drama, you know, we're like about to, we're about to go to districts. And so I went to practice with this pick line in my arm, which is like basically a, an IV that's inside of you. And like, they tell you, you can't do a lot of stuff with it. I didn't listen. So <laughs> I was out there just you know, doing what I need to do. And I go to the bathroom real quick and nobody knew. Um, and so I kept that hidden from my church family. Cause I, I didn't want everyone to like have that, you know, give me that label. Cause I had been around that. I had been, like, it was like two different worlds. You know, I'd walk into the doctor's office and they're like, okay, you know, you need to, you're fragile. You need to understand this. But then my mom and my parents were like, we're here for you. We're praying for you. You know, that's, that's all we can do, you know, but we want you to have this healthy lifestyle where you feel like you're not limited. Cause you know, when your body's limited, like it can limit your spirit, it can limit your mind. And, um, it can be, it can be more of a disability, you know, than actually physically. Um, and so my parents really did an awesome job with like giving me this foundation of you can do whatever you want and we're here for you to support you, but you're going to take this medicine also, <laughs> you know, kind of right. Thing. Right. And did the medicine have any, any side effects? Were you made to get sick from the medicine? Yeah. So when I got a little bit older, um, I had got married to this guy who was just as faith filled as I was. And he didn't understand CF at all. And so here I was coming into it with like, I had this chip on my shoulder a little bit of, you know, I don't really, I don't want to be your average sick patient. Like I just don't, you know, um, because I have this whole, this whole other side that's like so limitless. <laughs> and then my body's like, yeah, we can't really do that, you know, kind of thing at this point. And when you're a teenager too, like you're trying to fit in, you know? So my church was, you know, the, the main outlet that I had. And so I was like, I'm not telling nobody. I'm not having anybody like, you know, I, I didn't want everybody every day to be like, how are you feeling? <laughs> like, that was like a big thing. And uh, so I remember the, the moment that God really put on my heart, like, I need you to speak about this because this is your testimony and nobody's going to know it. Like, because you're just trying to keep this part of you hidden, you know, but there's a reason. As so I remember, I think I was like, I think it might've been like 19, maybe standing up in my youth group and telling everyone you know, this is, this is what I have going on, you know, and, uh, and it was wild. And so with the treatments, they didn't start really harshly affecting my body until I was, you know, in my late twenties, I think it was, or like somewhere around there. Um, well, no, it would be early twenties because when I got married and there was no explanation to the doctors were like, you shouldn't be having the side effects that you have, uh, until like years down the road but you're having them right now. So I'm like, well, I can't do that. You know, I can't do this one. It was kind of like weeding them out. 
And that's eventually what kind of led to my huge, like the main part of my story, which is that I stepped away from all of my treatments. Well, I want to go back just for a moment, because we're going to get to that part, because that's very brave of you. But uh, I work with a lot of women and, and my whole nonprofit was called is called the woman behind the smile, mm-hmm. because we all live hiding something, pretending that we're fine. And I can hear that in your story where mm-hmm. part of you was fine to the world, but then you were living, basically living a lie mm-hmm. uh, to the rest of the world. And, and that's okay. Sometimes that's a coping mechanism, mm-hmm. but at the point when you decided that, when you realized that it was, it was time to speak up, mm-hmm. how did you feel when you first came out and mm-hmm. were your parents are with you? Mm-hmm. So it actually, um, it was in a youth service and they had talked it up because my, my youth pastor was the only one that knew at the church because, you know, I would go in and I would cry in his office, you know, and say, this is the other me, you know, kind of thing. Um, and the Lord had been giving me these little nuggets, like the whole journey when CF just started, like, you know, cause it came fast and hard, like, and I was like, I can't hide this. I can't hide this. There was, there was suicidal thoughts at first. There was, um, you know, I remember like when pneumonia first hit me and it was like so strong, um, you know, and I was kind of, honestly, I was a baby (laughs) because I was like, this is the first time it's ever happened. And the doctors were like, this is normal. Like, you know, they told me I had pneumonia and I'm like, okay, what, what pills do I take? And they're like, no, it's not like that. Like you got to go in the hospital for two weeks and we do the pick line and then we'll send you home with it and kind of thing. And so I remember just being a little overwhelmed and, and during that time, like God taught me this process, which is what led to me having that service and, and sharing my heart. And he gave me these, like these little things to hold on to. And one of them was, Um, if it hurts too bad, I'll take you. And that didn't make sense to me until it's weird. Cause like, and God is so cool with the way that he gives us words because I held that. And honestly, it felt like this card in my pocket and it was like, Oh, if it gets too hard, like, that's how I thought I was like, I could just swipe this card and I'm out. Like that's that's how it was, you know? And I know, I know God knew that I would think that too. Not the plan. (laughs) <laughs> eventually like it made sense of like that's not the point at all <laughs> but the he gave me a dream also and in, in the dream it said um like the only thing that I heard uh, like as far as like a voice from God was your fear is bigger than your sickness mm. and that was massively like shattering for me and I was like okay so CF necessarily is not as big of an issue that I thought it's really the fear behind it because, you know, when I'm out and I'm like doing drama or something like that, and I feel my body, you know, start to like go, "Mm," like we got some limits. Well, I have two choices. You know what I mean? And the way I always take those is I just pray through it. (laughs) Usually I'll just keep going. Cause I'm like, I got one life. I'm going to live it. Um, So really there were so many signs that pointed to the Lord just being with me and that, this was part of the plan. Like this wasn't a mistake, you know, which was really difficult to wrap your head around, but it's like, no, God has a plan for me, but nobody can understand the, the, the aspect of what he's doing if I don't speak about it. So I need to set my pride aside for a minute and say, this is me. This is, you know, everything I'm going through. I need you guys to pray with me, but also I'm up here proclaiming that I will be healed. I'm going to be healed one day. I'm just walking you through this. And there was such a release. There was, it was like, oh, you know, I had like my best friend that was in, in the church service was there. Like the room was packed. <laughs> like everybody wanted to come and see like, what did Bethany have to say? I'm never spoke in front of people. So, you know, everyone's like, what did she have to say? It must be important. And uh, it was, it was the best service. Like everyone. Oh, what just, was the reaction of the, of the congregation? At first it was quiet. <laughs> you know, everyone was like, Cause they had seen me up there on stage. They had seen me. Like I, I used to do um, productions too. Like in the main sanctuary, I would play Mary, you know, mother of Jews. I'd play that for years. And so they were like, no, oh. you know, like she, I've, I've kept it so hidden. Like I would even like holding coughs. Like it was like that, like extreme where I was like, mm, I'm not letting anybody know. Um, I had dated somebody. He was there. He had no idea, you oh, know? Wow. So it was like, everyone just, you know, kind of surrounded me and was like, we're here for you, like in this, you know, and things of course did, you know, after that, you know, everybody would walk up and say, how are you feeling? (laughs) 
but I got used to it because I'm like they just care you know that's all it is like they don't look at me any different they don't think me as fragile like they really were just caring about how I was doing did you notice that people were trying to find out what CF was all about because honestly that's what I did Mm -hmm. After I, after I listened to your recordings, you and your sister did a good one called coffee with sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wanted to know what CF was because I haven't been around it. I have a friend who works with a, an organization down in, in Boca Raton. They do the yearly fundraisers and all that, but I, I don't know anybody that had it. So I'm like, how does it present? How does it change your life? And so I've been very interested in, and I've listened to a couple of nurses this morning. Yeah. And I know what one of our guests is actually a nurse and, and it's something that it probably gave you an opportunity to, to share With some awareness, yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's funny is, is I had always kept it in the background so much that I had to learn, <laughs> you know, I really did. I'm like, you know, what am I feeling right now? What is going on? Because this is all just like popping up when I'm 16 years old. And I got better things to do. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, every doctor's appointment, I'm sitting there going, okay, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And they're like, well, you know, your pancreas does not secrete the enzymes that you need to break up your food and process it. So you have to take these enzymes that help, you know? And then later on, you know, more of like a CF related diabetes um, popped up because your pancreas, you know, has a part to do with your insulin. So, you know, really it was just kind of like one thing led to another, to another. And then there was like, okay, you know, when I was, um, when I was younger, they had to go in and at birth, I had like a blockage. And so they had to go in and they had to take a piece of my small intestines out. Um, and so that, you know, that I would see like the scar and I'm like, okay, what is, what is this? What? <laughs> so, you know, my parents had to explain and then, like, that does cause like some issues sometimes. And so, so really it was just, okay, this is not just one aspect. This is something that I need to go to like CF school and learn, um, especially when I was writing my book and everything, it was like, okay, I have to get facts like straight, <laughs> you know? So I really had to sit down with doctors and, you know, say, okay, why, why does CF happen? Like what is, you know, you, I know parents have to be carriers. Okay. There's like a one in four chance, even when you are carriers, like all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, my sister on the other side was like, why didn't I get it? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Well, that's like, important to let folks know because it's, <laughs> genetic yes it's a genetic disease it is yeah. it, it, you know the, like I said I, there was a fabulous little short video that I watched this morning that explained it mm -hmm. and that would explain why your sister didn't get it right because mm -hmm. it's not contagious did she ever feel mm -hmm. that it was going to happen to her yeah she um at first she she explained it where she was like I was kind of jealous because I, I didn't know why you would get to go and get lollipops from the doctors you know like I always gave you one too you know you get the sticker you know yeah. um but she yeah she would just watch me kind of like every three months you know we would go to the doctors and she's just like kind of looking around and she's very observant my sister like observes everything and soaks it in um so you know there was like a time where I was doing my nebulizer and she was like can I try that <laughs> you know this kind of stuff like just you know wanting to be a part of it and then as she grew up of course she understood like you know this is a blessing that you know, I don't have this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so really she became, she became a great like support system as far as like, you've got this, you know, you got this, like, she doesn't let me get down and out. She really just, you know, what I used to do for her, as far as like the protection aspect, like she does that to me in a different way, you know, and she's like, let's go, let, you know, let's keep on going. She'll sit in the hospital with me, you know, when I'm in the hospital. And, uh, so she just really has got like this, you know, understanding of what CF is and now sees it as a blessing that, you know, it's not like a family thing that we've had to all walk through because there are CF patients that do have siblings. Um, and that's difficult because you have bugs that you can pass back and forth. And that's what I, that's what I, uh, I learned that, you know, you can't be around other CF patients. And exactly. I wondered how would you even know if they were? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so I had a friend um, back in my teenage years that I got really close to and he has CF. And we're still friends, um, but he lives in another state and everything now. But then that was huge because there's, you know, all kinds of bugs that you can pass through each other. There's one that's really um, dangerous to pass, like it's fatal. And so I, you know, kind of, he was at the service that I spoke mm -hmm. at and I had seen him and I was like connected right away. And it was like, I have a connection with this kid. Like, I don't know why, but he came up to the altar and I prayed with him. And so I'm holding him like this, you know, praying 
no idea. Right. Wow. And so he knew, <laughs> so there was like a, he, you know, he kind of pulled back for a minute and I was like, what's, what's you know, and my mom, she was like, Oh, <laughs> she knew oh. and what's funny is she was like a friend of the family like from a long time back so had no idea and he introduced himself and I was like cool yeah man and he's like I have CF and I was like okay <laughs> you know? oh well you know kind of thing and we were actually in dramas together and everything and it was like a huge like I don't know we just kind of took a chance you know because there was such a connection as far as like he was the only one that actually when he said I know what you're going through like he knew what I was going through. He did. I think yeah. there, I don't know if there was a movie that I'm recalling. There yeah. was <laughs> five feet apart. Is that yes. Yeah. That, it just hit me that that's exactly it. Now exactly. Those, those kids have CF. Yes. There yes. That, so when that movie came out, that was I actually filled up a theater. Like I brought all my friends <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's go support this movie. Cause you know, there had been such a buzz in the CF community that like this was legit. Cause there's been other like portrayals of CF like I think Grey's Anatomy had like something or whatever, but like little stuff, you know what I mean? And this was like the first time there had been like a whole film. And I knew um, that one of the big CF speakers, her name was Claire. Um, she was a huge advocate for CF, but she was on set and she was helping, you know, like really portray this disease the way it's supposed to be portrayed. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in the theater and just bawling because I was like, oh my gosh, this is my life, like on screen, you know? And, uh, and so everyone in the theater, like there was just such a realization of like, that's what you go. Like, it was like, they were sitting in my hospital room, you know, like, this is crazy. Like now we know, and it brought such an awareness to CF. Like it, it really did like shake everything. <laughs> and it was like, okay, now you can just say, have you seen five feet apart? That's what CF is. Yeah. And yeah. that's interesting. Cause I hadn't thought about that until just this moment when yeah. you said that, I'm thinking I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. It really was a lovely film. Right. Um, so everybody go see Five Feet Apart. It's, yes. It was lovely. Um, but for many years, though, besides the, C, the CF, you kept hidden the fact of, about your dad and about mm -hmm. the mental health. And I, I mm -hmm. have had many guests over the year, a couple of years, where that's been brought up because when I was young, we didn't talk mental health. Right. That, and when you did, it was there was such a, a stigma attached mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. that. And, and it was just not talked about. So that in, if, in itself, I remember listening to your story with your sister uh, mm -hmm. protecting her, but then she felt angry because you left her out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a fine line between what we say to a young child and what we don't. Um, and now your parents are still together, still alive, mm -hmm. still dealing yeah, still with it together. Yeah. Um, do you still see the episodes with your dad or is that managed somehow or? Yeah, he, um, so we've tried different like medications in the past and whatnot. And he, you know, he says he gets like weird feelings on most of them. Um, so really what we do is there's signs, there's signs to right before he breaks down into an episode. And so we kind of go into scramble mode. Um, I'm like, okay, so go ahead and take off work, dad, you know, this week I'll talk to the boss and kind of thing. And I, I put on my parent pants, you know, for a minute, um, even with, you know, having been married and out of the house and not like right in the middle of it, because really my sister was the one who, cause my mom had a mental breakdown in 2016. Um, and she never came out of it. So where my father, like we had these episodes and we're like, okay, dad's coming back. You know, there was like signs of he was coming back into reality and really like he was never, I'm so thankful. Like he never was violent. He was never mean. Like he just sits there quietly, you know, and he can tell he's just processing and just thinking and really just overthinking about everything. And he gets, he does get protective. So he's like, all right, everybody, like we're going to stay in the living room, you know, <laughs> like where I can keep an eye on you. Cause he feels like dad, but he feels like he's out of control. You know what I mean? So he feels like he, the only way to like keep us safe is to have us right here. And so we understand that. So there's been like times where I'll go over, you know, cause being married and out of the house, if he's going through an episode, you know, I'm going to try to be there, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> kind of thing. And so we have like a process. Well, I used to do that with my mom, you know, we'd kind of go into damage control, but when mom uh, got her mental breakdown and there was really no answers for it, except they diagnosed her with perimenopause mm -hmm. and that was it. But there was definitely like a form of depression, um, anxiety and things like this, because she has had a really rough life, bless her heart. Like there were so many things you know, that kind of went on. And then at this point, um, when she was going through this, I was the sickest I'd ever been. So I had walked away from the medication. I had, you know, been like, I think a year in 
or whatever of not doing anything. Well, she was like my nurse, you know, my mom would have like a regimen for me and be like, take this. So to see that kind of like go away, you know, and, and she can't do anything. I really no feel like, control. yeah, there was like this sense of like, okay, I'm, my daughter is like getting sicker, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And she just checked out and we waited, you know, for her to like come back and she never did. Wow. So it was got to like, be terribly, terribly confusing. And your, your sister was how old at that point? Um, she was, she was a t- teenager. Okay. Yeah. Whenever mom was okay. with mom. Um, but like when she first saw this go down with dad and we could not hide it, you know, it was right there in front of her. It was actually right before I had gotten married. So he was in an episode, uh, so much as like a few days before my wedding. And so we actually didn't know if he was even going to be able to be a part of the wedding. And I remember when he kind of came out of this, he, that's the first thing he asked me was like, did I miss your wedding? Oh. And I was like, no, he didn't, you know, he was able to walk me up the aisle and everything. Um, but that was the first time where she, my sister had to process and like, understand like, what is this? And we had that, you know, this has been going on for years and she felt very left out and very confused. And she said, you know, she, she basically was like, you guys have a secret language that you and mom communicate and I'm not a part of it. And so there was a part of her that we would be, cause that really scarred her, you know, um, going through that, but there would be parts where we're like out, you know, having a good family time and dad would just get quiet for a minute. And I would feel, I could see this fear just like come over her. And like, she's trying to like, look at me to like, you know, and she's watching me and mom for like signs and signals and this kind of stuff. So she ended up being kind of on eggshells and, you know, until she was able to, you know, get to the point where me and my mom were, where we could process it and, you know, kind of like bring out the plan and say, okay, this is how dad walks through this. And, um, he hasn't had an episode in a, in a couple of years. Um, I believe it's been, and the last one was actually faster. Like he came out of it a lot faster. I think it was maybe like a week because sometimes, you know, they could be like a couple of weeks to a month, I think was the longest, wow. but it really is what I've noticed about him is it's if he allows himself to stay in it. So there's like a point where he goes, cause he explained to me, I was like, how do you get out? Because I had my own nervous breakdown. Like I had my own, like, you know, mental breakdown. And that's where my sister was like, everybody has lost it, but me, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And it's like, I mean, like, that's not, that's not exactly a family trait you want to have. You know? <laughs> um, but when I had my mental breakdown, I remember like dad was the first one that I was like gravitated to. And I was like, help me. Like, you know, I, I've, I've walked through these with you. Like, I don't know what to do. And he almost had like a map. He was like, all right, this is how you get out. Like, you know, and because he had done it for so many years that he like knew the process and he can remember everything while he's in these episodes. It's just a stress induced breakdown where he just gets tired. And so he was helping me really walk through that. And he said, um, you know, I remember one time being in a restaurant and like looking around, he's like, yeah, okay. You're going to feel like everybody's looking at you, but they're not, you know, <laughs> let's just eat our barbecue you know, kind of thing. And so I, I was thankful for that. Like I was thankful for all the times that we had walked through it, but he explained to me, like when he comes out of it, um, like one of the last times he, you know, he had my sister like sleeping on the couch cause he wanted everybody in the living room and he looked over and he was like, I have to get myself out of this for her. So if he stays in it, it's because of, you know, himself. Yeah. yeah. But when he starts thinking of us, that's what helps bring him back. It's really wild. Really interesting. Cause you know, it's gotta be the dad, the protector mode. Yes. But then dad, the leave me alone mode. Yeah. And where do you guys fall? And, and your sister at that age too, a teenager, that's such a tenuous time anyway. I know, yeah. And to not have the trust, she probably lost trust in anybody telling her mm-hmm. the truth. Yeah. Uh, and then trying to understand, you know, how, how she could play a role in that. I was very, give her, give her a lot of credit and yeah, uh, I give her a hug yeah. from me. Cause I, I really, I like that, uh, that YouTube video you guys did called coffee with sisters. It was very mm-hmm. open from her mm-hmm. point of view. Mm-hmm. It was very interesting to see her point of view of this whole thing. Yes. So now moving back to you, you mm-hmm. yeah, as a child, but not manifesting itself into your teenager, again, a very difficult time. Yeah. Mentally, physically, anyway, mm-hmm. worried about what you're going to look like, what you feel like, you know, your whole body image. I mm-hmm. imagine mm-hmm. when this started to affect you physically, kind of walk us through that and how, how you coped or, or hid mm. through this whole thing until you. Well, I was, yeah. So I was still, you know, um, 
like when I would do hospital stays, I had to make up excuses, you know, like, oh, I'm just not feeling too good or something. Cause I would never tell them, you know, that I was in the hospital. Um, and then once, you, you know, there would be times where I would like, just do a little, <laughs> little cough or whatever. Like you would always hear me like <clears throat> kind of under my breath. And, uh, some of the, some of the kids, I kind of talked to them later. Like, I was like, so what'd you think? Like when you would hear me, like, you know, cough, like, I would just like you had asthma or something, you know? <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay, so I did a good job, you know, kind of thing. Um, and I was like, obviously like more thin than most teenagers, uh, which that all, always was like a huge deal. Cause I like never liked to wear shorts and it's Florida and it's hot, you know? So everyone's in shorts and I'm over here in pants. And they're like, why do you have to wear shorts? You know? kind of thing. So there was always like questions. There really was there. Were, so even though I hid it, I think people really, you know, just wanted to know me, you know? And so like, obviously like normal teenage questions, like, aren't you in shorts or, you know, you, you good? Like kind of thing. And <clears throat> so once I finally like told everyone, I did just kind of like hang that coat up and I was like, all right, this is me. This is who I am. You know, I'm going to have coughing fits. I'm going to you know, uh, sometimes I have to go to the bathroom and throw up after practice or something like that. And, uh, I was always eating. So I had to like, you know, eat twice as much as normal people, uh, just to gain some calories or even just to keep on what I had. Cause like, I would just lose like crazy. If I skipped one meal, I'd lose like five pounds. <laughs> like it was so frustrating because your and body's it, not processing that. Not absorbing. Right? Yeah. Not I was absorbing not absorbing it. it. Um, you know, the, the enzymes would help, but like over the years, they've like lit, you know, raised the, the amount of enzymes I'm taking and this kind of stuff. And so I think at that point, you know, there was like, you know, people were like, oh, that's a blessing. You know, they're like trying to like make you feel like you can eat all this cake. And I'm like, I hate cake. Like, <laughs> like, I don't want this, you know, and my doctors will be like, just eat, you know, all the junk food. Like you got to get calories. And I'm like, what about my teeth? What about my blood sugar? <laughs> like, and they're like, Bethany, it doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> you know, but for me, I was always thinking of long-term and CF then was just like, we're just going to get through the now. Like, let's not talk about this. Yeah. Cause really they're not expecting you to get over here, you know? So like right now you need to gain weight because the more weight you have, the better off your lung function is going to be when you get sick and you don't eat and you can't eat, like you're not going to drop down to a crazy, you know, low level. Um, if you have meat on your bones. So like they would, you know, sit here and like go through the process. And I'm just like, but what about this? It's like, it doesn't matter. Um, but so when I started just like being me, you know, and not really caring, um, there was a part of me, the only thing I was worried about was like, nobody was going to date me. That was the only thing I was worried about. It's like, how am I going to fall in love? <laughs> like, <laughs> it was a big deal for me. Uh, but that wasn't a problem. And even my, um, ex-boyfriend when I had, you know, come out and told everybody, he's like, it doesn't matter. Like it wouldn't have mattered. Like, honestly, <laughs> And I was like, okay. So like, it was so much bigger in my mind mm -hmm. than what it ended up being. And it, the only thing it really did was like, make everybody go, wow, like you're actually pushing through this to do this. Like it was, it was a positive thing. And I'm like, wow, now I have a testimony. Like it was so clear that like, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to talk about this. I'm supposed to be open. And I just have to set down that pride and just say, this is who I am. And it was kind of like, it, I felt like it was a little bit opposite of what my parents had, you know, taught me as far as like, this isn't you, you're not limited. I needed that too, you know, but it's like, okay, but this is me, but I'm still not limited, you know? So it was like taking what they taught me in all the right ways, you know, I, I knew what they were teaching me, um, but because they were still making me take my medicine and all that stuff. But then it's like, okay, now I'm an adult. And I definitely went through processes of like, okay, I'm an adult. This is who I am. I still don't like taking my medicine. I still don't like going to the hospital, but whatever, you know, kind of thing to like, okay, this is who I am. And I'm not doing my medicine. I'm not doing any of this. I'm just going to try to live a normal life as much as I can. And then, you know, just, just understanding, like there's, there's a process that goes through your mind. Like when you're dealing with a terminal illness like this of like, okay, it's my identity as far as. I, I obviously deal with this. And my mom always said, you're diagnosed. You don't have, you are diagnosed. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Uh, and um, to understanding, like, you don't have to be that sickness, if that makes sense. Like you, you can still do things. Right. It's, it's not you. It doesn't define yes. you. You're living with it. But at one point, <clears throat> like you said, when you can choose for yourself, 
-hmm. we're going to move into that. You actually Mm -hmm. chose to stop some Mm -hmm. of the traditional medicines. Mm -hmm. What made you that? How did you make that choice? And then what did you do? Yeah. So this was really where rubber meets the road, you know, and, and now Bethany has uh, the chance to be who Bethany wants. You know, I was out of my parents' house. I was no longer having my mom like sit there and go over the vitamins and the medicines with me. And I was also seeing no real uh, positive effects uh, as much as I wanted anyway from the treatments. And so there was, you know, like I said, um, my husband was super like, you know, faith filled. So he didn't understand either. So it was like, I didn't have him, you know, to be, like, okay, you know, like, <laughs> here's all you want you to stay on the, on the traditional protocols? No, no, it was, it was very much like you do what you want kind of thing. Okay. You know, because he knew that I had been told, you know, for all these years, um, what to do as far as treatment wise. And so I was like, well, now I have my own choice. I've never wanted this life anyway, you know? So there was like that to process. And it was like, okay, I'm not seeing the results I want to. So I'm just going to walk away. And it was honestly like that, like, I was like, God has you know, given me all these words. Like he's, he's promised me this. And, and I still had that card in my pocket, right. Of like, I know if it gets too hard, it'll take me. And so I had all these reasons to be like, okay, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. My fear is bigger than my sickness, blah, blah, blah. So I took all of that, that he was like giving me as just like nuggets. And I'm like, cool, I'm doing this. Like <laughs> there was no real, like, prayer behind it. It wasn't, it was just like, okay, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I'm sick of it, but I still fully believe that God would heal me, you yeah. know, because I had that faith, like crazy faith, um, foundation. And so I remember going in and talking to my doctors and saying like, I'm not doing this anymore. And that was like, what, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And, and so and they had back from the doctors. They, they wrote on my like my medical sheet or whatever after visit summary that I have, you know, walked away and kind of given up on life basically. Um, because that's what you're doing essentially. Like in CF, if you walk away from your treatments, like you're basically just, you know, taking the L and be like, all right, mom, I don't want to do this anymore kind of thing. And so, but my aspect was like, I'm going to be healed. Like <laughs> it's going to be fine. You know, <laughs> I told him, I was like, I'll be back. I'll be over 130 pounds. I'll have a baby. Like I'll be back. And they're just like, Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, but I was actually really shocked. Like the doctors, you know, were listening to my heart and they were understanding like what I was going through as a person and see, you know, they knew that the, the medicines were not doing what we wanted them to do in a lot of ways. Like one was, you know, I was losing my hearing from one and they were like, you should not be feeling these like until years down the road. So it was very strange for them too, but walked away and I remember I didn't even have an inhaler. Like I, I had nothing for two years. Just, just, I would try natural stuff. You know, I would just, whatever, whatever I could do. Um, and then I started just really pushing into the healing aspect of things. And I had this little book of scriptures, this little book of healing scriptures. And I started taking that like my medicine, you know, but here I am, like, see, I have all this faith. And it was like, my body was like totally just dying. Like it was whittling away, but honestly, like I didn't care. You know, I was like, I kind of, I assumed this would happen, you know, but like, I still have faith. And I would, I would keep going back to like all these scriptures where, you know, God came in at the last moment and, you know, (laughs) you know, he healed the little girl. He did this, he did this, like, he can still do this. Like, even though I'm literal bones, like I got down to 71 pounds and my oxygen levels were like, so low that I just stopped checking them, you know, and there would be moments where I would be like trying to walk through the mall and I would start like, like kind of falling over. Cause like I was, I was dying. Like my body was just giving up, but my spirit was like, Mm-mm. like, no, we have a lot to live for, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and so I do want to talk about the moment that I played that card. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause it was right then when, you know, I had lost my mom to, to mental illness in a way, like she was still there, but she was not the same like rock that she was. So she wasn't there to go, Bethany, like, why are you not taking the medicines? Like didn't have that, you know? Um, and then with that, it was always off and on, you know, we're like, okay, I'm parent now. Okay. Now, you know, you're telling me what to do. And I got to process that, you know, kind of thing. How about your sister? Did she step in? Uh, she did. She did a lot. She did. 
um, just kind of like hearing me out more so. Okay, but not, not the uh, enforcer saying, come on, no, back, it's been working. Mm-mm. Not with the medicines. Like she was like telling me, don't give up. Like, you know, you're not allowed. And she would even throw in the fact of like, I need you, you know, so like, you can't do this to me kind of thing. Cause she knew that, that, you know, that would hit home. Yeah. Uh, so stuff like that, where she didn't want to tell me what to do, because again, she, you know, she understood that I was always, you know, and, and in a lot of ways, mom was more nurse than she was, you know, as far as what she had to do, mm-hmm. you know? So I was growing up, I was like, okay, we're not, you know, you're not going to give me these pills anymore. Like I'm going to do this myself and that kind of stuff. So she really, she saw all that. So she knew to like, all right, I'm going to step back and, you know, just hope that you push through this. And nobody really knew what to do either. Like, I remember feeling like even people in my church, like they would just pray for me. That's all they could do because this was my choice. You know, I was yeah, because I'm sitting here going, well, there's that choice. And then the other, the other reasoning is, you know, God does provide medicine. <laughs> right. Doctors. right. And that, that was my whole story. Like, and that's, that's why the CF community has like come after me and they're like, yo, tell your story. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what ended up happening is I was over here just like faith, 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 and thinking that the medicines were not helping. And in a lot of ways they weren't like, let's just be honest. My body was rejecting a lot of stuff. So what I did was I was like, all right forget that just going on faith started writing my book and it became like, this is going to be the last thing that I do. Like, this is going to be my goodbye book. Um, and that's why my book has three different endings. Oh, wow. Reading it. You're like, okay, this is that Bethany. This is a new Bethany. You know what I mean? Like, cause I was going through a like car wash, like as far as, okay, so body's dying. I'm weak. I'm tired. I can't walk. Like, what am I doing to like, boom, faith. Like it was like two, you know, two Bethany's. <laughs> and so it's like, man, I'm full of faith. Like I'm getting all these words from people at church. Like, you know, I had a vision of you, you know, with children and, and you're running through the park with your kids. And like, and I'm sitting here like dying, like, there's no way, like, how, how is this going to happen? And what's so wild is during this time, um, you know, I, I was going through stuff in my marriage and all kind of stuff. And it was like every angle, my mom, my dad, you know, this, 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 you know, dad had a breakdown in the middle of that. And then I broke and I, I just, I lost it. I, I really did. I had this severe mental breakdown where I just remember like trying to find a way out. I remember sitting in the ER, this was right, right before COVID like really was breaking out, but like there was like, it was starting and that was scary for CF, you know? <laughs> Uh, and so I remember going to the ER, like the ambulance had to come and get me and everything. And I remember just being like, okay, what is the way out? Like, I have got to have a way out because I had played that card. I played the card. Um, I remember I, I asked my mom if I could actually go in a room, which her room is like sacred. <laughs> She's like, nobody come in here. <laughs> you know? Um, and I remember like, I was so sick and so tired and I was like, mom, could I please like, just come in your room and like, you can hold me for a minute. And she's still mom in there. So she did let me come in her room. Uh, And so I remember laying on the bed with her and I was like, all right, I'm going to wait till she goes to sleep. And then I'm going to play this card. Like, and I had kept it for all those years. Like this was back in 2020, you know? (laughs) So like, since I was like 18, I've been holding this card and I was like, all right. And it was like, it was like something that I swore I'd never do. I was like, I'll never play that card. It's just for peace of mind, you know? And I played it and I was like, all right, I need you to take me. Like I'm done. And nothing happened. (laughs) And I was like, wait, hold on. (laughs) Okay. Take two. I'm ready to go. (laughs) Nothing happened. So I just like lost it because I thought I had this way out Yeah. and I did not. That's not what he meant. And so he really explained to me. And I, I feel like what happened in that moment is I literally gave him everything and was like, go ahead and do what you want now. Like, here's my, whatever I'm trying to do here. Like I've been trying to make the decisions. I'm, I'm still like, I have God obviously right here and I'm like praying for healing, but I've been making these moves, right. Of like, I stopped the medicine. I did this. I took words that he gave me and like made them kind of what I wanted to, you know, Absolutely. I'm like, all right. He said, your fear is bigger than your sickness. Obviously the sickness isn't that big. And God's probably like, <laughs> how do you do this? Um, but so I ended up going to the ER and I remember like being bombarded. Like I felt like Satan was like right in my ear. Cause it was like, 
uh, okay, everything that I thought is not the case. I'm trapped. I am trapped in this body where that was like, that was a feeling of like, I could get out when I wanted. And I know it sounds crazy, but that's just how I thought, you know? And now it's like, no, like you're stuck, like you're stuck in this body. And so the enemy really started just like playing with me and was like, well, if you didn't hear that right, like what else did you not hear? Right. Like you weren't supposed to stop all your medicine, were you? And like all this stuff where it's like, yeah, like now I'm, I'm 71 pounds. I'm dying. I've already written my funeral. Cause like it's happening and I can't go back. Like, what do I do? So it was like such a, such a sense of like being in this cage of like a broken body and there being no real hope, you know? And the Lord had to literally just like turn my whole world upside down. Uh, stuff happened in my marriage and I was left alone. I was alone during the pandemic when it happened. Uh, just me in my house. <laughs> I couldn't drive because I didn't have my driver's license because I'd been so sick that I never really got it. You know, um, I had like practice for it and everything, but then just never, because I was having like these little, you know, moments where I was like, kind of yeah, not- out in a sense. I was like, I can't drive. Right. So I was trapped just like in the house for like however many months that was. And just like asking the Lord what to do. Like, God, now you talk to me. Like, I'm done. I'm done talking. I'm done making the decision. And uh, believe it or not, in the two years that I had walked away, there was a treatment that came out for CF that shook everything. Like it, it changed CF. And I was like, I have to go back. Like I have to go back. And people had sent me, it was like a year before. So like in my two years, it was like, I went a whole year after this treatment had come out. Cause I was like, that's not my answer. You know, people were sending it to me like, Bethany, look, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but that's not like, that's not, I'm not going back. I'm not going backwards kind of thing. Like I was just so, you know, stuck in my ways and, but still believing God for healing. And so, so I remember sitting there and actually um, there was a minister on the TV and I was praying and it was like, as I was praying, I just like saw me in a hospital with new lungs. That's all I saw was like a little, you know, vision. And this pastor on the TV, as soon as I saw that, he was like, you know, you know, Jesus is not walking around healing people like he used to. He's not here physically. He uses doctors. He uses medicine. And I was like, all right. So I called my clinic and I was like, hi, it's Bethany. And they're like, Bethany. <laughs> back. <laughs> and I was like, I need to get in. And they're like, all right, we can see you in a couple of days and went in and they were like, listen, my doctor literally said CF is no longer a death sentence. We have this new treatment and you have the perfect gene mutation for it. And we're getting you on it. So the two years that you were off had your body was still able to recover. It, you didn't go so far down the rabbit hole that you damaged yourself beyond. Yeah. And that's funny. Cause like God had given my mom a word like a long time ago when I was a teenager that God would reverse it. Huh? Yeah. And so she held, like she kept that word. And I was actually told that too, when I got a little older, there was a man that came up to me. He's like, I don't know why, but I just hear the Lord saying he's going to reverse it. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but okay, thanks. You know, kind of thing. So our hour is flying by and I knew yeah. it would. So <laughs> fast forward today. Yeah. What, what's happened? Yeah. So I've been on the treatment for over a year. Um, what's funny is they said it would take a few months, like seven months to get to me. It came in like a couple months. So super quick. I started it. Uh, I have never coughed again. Like I don't cough anymore. Um, this is the first kind of medication that targets the actual gene mutation. So it's not just like helping the symptom. It's helping the actual disease. Okay. Um, I am like a huge advocate, you know, at my doctors, I, I talk to everybody about like the importance of medicine and faith yeah. that you need both. Um, and I feel like that's a huge part of like why I went through what I did, like, cause the Lord is good. Like he's going to use what I've been through, even if there was mistakes made, you know, to, to bring a message. And that's the message is like, you can have faith all day long, but I was dying on just faith, mm-hmm. you know? So the Lord sustained me. That's what he did. He sustained me. And then he sent me back and said, this is for you go to, I brought this in, you know, like the medicine came in perfect time. So that's kind of what I've been doing is I go to my clinics every, you know, every few months again, um, I wrote the book I'm, I'm speaking, I'm, you know, just, just getting it off the ground basically because it came out in January. Um, so 
I'm, I'm just kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm going through life. There's, there's still moments where like, I, I did get COVID. I did, you know, get this little flu. And so there's always like the need for me to stay close to the father, you know, and pray through things. I'll still have moments where I'll feel my lungs a little weak, you know, here and there, but I'm like, no, the Lord got me through it. Like I'm taking my medicine. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to be okay. So really it's just, you know, kind of like riding this wave of, um, enjoying the life that he gave me, you know, so thankfully I feel like I have, a, I had a second chance, you know, that, that God completely just turned my life around. Um, my father's doing well, my mother, I go see her every Wednesday, you know, and, uh, and stuff like that. And my sister's doing great. Uh, she's a chef. <laughs> she's a chef uh -huh. now. Yeah. Um, so it, life is good. Life is good. And I just, I, I teach my story. That's what I oh, do. And that's, that's the importance. And that's what I loved about it. And you're actually, your book is called my story continues. And that is out. Is that on Amazon? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, available. Available. it's available everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's available on your website. Tell everybody wh yes. what your website is. Um, my website is it's bethanybryan.com. Bethanybryan.com. We'll put that out there. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a story of standing up and speaking up. And I'm, I, I hope, and I know I would think that the CF community has really embraced this mm -hmm. because you're probably, you've lived what all the other kids have lived the folks that have had it is, you know, do what you're told to do and then mm -hmm. rebel against it and yep. then choose to come back and with power now and with experience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can put a smile on your face and say, this is the real me. Yeah. I've had these experiences. They don't define me, yeah. but they've made me who I am today. Yes. And he, I'm telling you this because uh, that's like my story. If I can help one person, mm -hmm. either prevent well you can't prevent cf but you know mm -hmm. it, uh, you can understand it yes or yeah. uh prevent the heartache that you went through because of what mm -hmm. i'm telling you exactly you've helped one person and that makes the makes it valuable yes that's valuable yes and you obviously uh made a real impact on keith yeah <laughs> the first one, he's the first one that contacted me and said you gotta talk to bethany you gotta oh, hear a story yeah. And I'm so glad that we connected and you're doing some great things in acting and you just yes. have a beautiful smile. And, and I just want to thank you for your story and for your presence. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love being able to tell it. We overcome by the blood of lamb and the word of our testimony. That's what I well, exactly. <laughs> and the strength of your story is out there for the world now. And it's important to, for all of us to understand it because mm -hmm. there could be someone next door that has it. And we don't know because they're hiding. Right. Oh my and gosh. I encourage so many people to tell their story. Like, please tell your story. <laughs> well, and, and I was on a seminar, a webinar yesterday and we brought up the idea of, of blaming and victim blaming and, and yeah. people that can be nasty and bullies and all that stuff that's out there right now. And the uncivility or isn't whatever the incivility of the world. And it's a mm -hmm. shame. And mm -hmm. I think so many people that have a story don't want to tell it because of the reaction of others. Exactly. Yeah. But what I've always contended is that that one person that's the naysayer that's giving you that stink eye, as I called it, is not the person you need to be touching. Mm -hmm. The person sitting beside him going, that's me. Yeah. Yeah. Or a family member. So what you're doing, thank you for what you're doing. It's, it, thank you so much. it's a great mission. And I know it was painful. Mm -hmm. but it's full of purpose and I, and I applaud you for that. So thank you for thank being you my so much. <laughs> this is uh, fun. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. So folks go see my story continues. It's Bethany Bryan's book. It's on Amazon. It's all over. Go to bethanybryan.com. Look at her story. And if you know anybody with CF cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. get them in touch with Bethany and get them in touch with the, the it, there's a CF association. What's the official? Oh yeah. Yeah. So there's a bunch of different like help. Like there's a, there's a, there's a compass, a CF compass. They help with everything from education to like uh, therapies. They're great. They're great. Okay. Well, don't be ignorant folks. Let's really yes. get out there and find out about what's going on here and, and be the one for someone else. So thanks. Okay. Anthony. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank my, you so much thanks for another wonderful stand up and speak up show. I really appreciate it. Bit, everybody being here. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to stand up and speak up. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self. If you are the victim of a scam or cybercrime, 
please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based in Miami, Florida, supporting scam victims worldwide. If you can, make a small donation to help victims around the world receive the help they need. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfoteaming products at BenfoComplete.com. Use the special code STANDUP for a 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thank you for being with us today. Go to my website, The Woman Behind the Smile, for additional resources and information. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and enjoy the replays. My books are all available on Amazon.com and Audible, and I encourage you to join us again. Have a great day.